والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وخاتم النبيين وسيد المرسلين أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين ولعنة الله الدائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين من ليلتنا هذه إلى قيام يوم الدين السلام عليك يا أبا عبد الله وعلى الأرواح التي حلت بفنائك عليك مني سلام الله أبدا ما بقيت وبقي الليل والنهار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أصحاب الحسين صلوات على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد my dear brothers and sisters in Islam and Iman, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuh. Tonight is the eighth night of the month of Muharram and we'd like to continue the discussion we've been having about the important things that we need to know um, according to Imam Sadiq Islam. Until now we've talked about knowledge of your Lord, which was one of those four categories of need to know knowledge, and then what He's done for us and with us. And then tonight we'd like to um, finish the third category, which is what is it that our Lord wants of us? What is our responsibility to our Lord? Within that, we talked about the responsibility we have when it comes to observing um, the rights that He has on us, worshipping Him, staying away from those things that He prevented us and prohibited us, prohibited us from going towards. And we talked about a little bit about the rights and responsibilities when it comes to a family. And then we began the discussion about the responsibilities we have when it comes to our community. Um, and how it's the case that Islam, within the Islamic teachings, we have routes to approach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which involve the way that we interact with other people, even outside of our own families. Just to recap, some of the principles that we talked about yesterday from the Qur'an and the Hadith were, number one, taking a balanced approach. Meaning that we should never sacrifice ourselves um, in the sense that we turn away ourselves away from Allah in order to save somebody else. And as a, just as a quick summary of that, meaning that we should never throw ourselves into the hellfire in order to get somebody else into paradise. What that means is that in the spirit of activism, in the spirit of doing events and of inviting people to the truth, 
if we are not careful, if we don't keep tabs on our own selves and keep our own routine going and be balanced about it, we can easily lose um, ourselves in this mission. And at the end of it, we end up perhaps being a source of somebody being guided, but we are, ourselves have been misguided in the process. Second of all is to keep in mind that the benefit is all um, in the process of doing it for the sake of Allah. We shouldn't be looking for something else to come after that. As soon as we take any step um, of inviting somebody to the truth or doing Amr al-Ma'roof, Nahyan al-Munkar or, um, or for example taking care of the needs of the believers all these things are done as, not so that we get a reward afterwards but the act itself knowing that Allah is pleased with us should be enough for us and then that leads us to the point about doing it um, for, for the sake of Allah not expecting reward from the person sometimes the person may even um, reject that offer of help and guidance and truth that we give to them. But we can deal with that, it's okay. Now tonight I'd like to mention a few more principles that are very essential, very important, um, that perhaps are not talked about too much because this side of Islam sometimes um, is not seen as being as important as the other things. Whereas we find that Islam is a very, has, has a lot of teachings in this regard. The Imams والسلام, would push their followers to put these teachings into practice um, alongside those devotional acts that everyone else was doing. And with these types of things, really, we can see that the Shias were being encouraged to distinguish themselves from um, the other Muslims. So what are some of those other principles that we have? Uh, one of them, which is very important um, when it comes to our responsibilities, when it comes to others, is the importance of making sure that we meet with other believers. We have to make it part of our regular routine to come together with believers and spend time with them. And according to the ahadith, this can take various forms. In one hadith, we're told that we should go to their homes and actually pay visits to each other. Other ahadith talk about going, coming together, gathering together, and then reviving the affair of the Ahlul Bayt What does it mean to revive the affair? It means to teach each other and to learn from each other the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt Now one of the, aside from visiting each other, which is a very important thing, we need to have that practice amongst each other. And just as a side point, it shouldn't be the case that we, we turn away from doing that, that we stop doing that because of um, not wanting to impose on each other. Um, this type of imposition is actually a mercy for both parties involved. And um, sometimes we need to break that barrier because maybe as part of the culture we're in, people don't tend to visit each other at homes, maybe they want to go out to restaurants. But we, should, we shouldn't feel the need to just conform to the culture if this is what the Ahlul Bayt are telling us to do. We need to go visit one another, um, not impose, impose, but not in the sense of demanding a lot when we go there. If a cup of tea should suffice, but of course if there's more, then we can happily take it. And those who are inviting people, they shouldn't feel the need to like go all out, even something simple is enough because the purpose is to act according to the instructions of the Ahlul Bayt. And the purpose is for the sake of Allah. And we're told in hadith that if we meet each other for the sake of Allah, then even though we think that we're going to meet some individual, we are actually meeting Allah. Allah says Himself that it is if you are meeting me. So this is the reward that's promised for us. But it goes beyond just meeting uh, at people's homes. And one of the the, the most apparent, um, you could say, examples that we have in our current um, situation of acting on this hadith is to come together at the centers. This is something which is very important for us to uphold, this practice of coming together at the centers um, on a regular basis, to meet with one another, to share with one another news about ourselves, to get an understanding of what's going on in each other's lives, to revive the affair of the Ahlul Bayt by um, recounting their teachings and learning about what they have to say, by reciting the du'as that they have given to us, and um, by uh, showing respect to the Sha'air of Allah, showing respect to those great symbols of Islam, for example, the sacrifice of Imam Hussein al-Islam. This is part and parcel of our faith. And if we want to act upon um, this commandment that we have from the Ahlul Bayt, then we need to do it throughout the year. Of course, 
you know, the message of Imam Hussain is so powerful that it draws together the believers uh, no matter what they are doing the rest of the year. But it's important for us to carry on this energy even throughout, in, throughout the year. Now, sometimes, sometimes people come up with um, various excuses. One of the excuses you hear in, in today's world is that, well, if it's a matter of getting the lecture, then we can just go online and find a lot of lectures there. In, in, in fact, the same lecture that might be playing at the center, well, we can get it at the convenience of our home being broadcasted live. What's the point of driving all the way, especially in a place like Los Angeles, where you know, there's so much traffic and everything's so spread out? Why don't we just stay at home and at the, com you know, at the comfort of our computer, listen to it? Well, this is not a bad thing to do. It's, 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 it can be useful, it can be beneficial, but we shouldn't suffice with that. Because the ahadith talk about actually going to see one another. And for example, there's a hadith that we have here that um, this is from Imam Al Jawad who says that mulaqat al ikhwan, the meeting of believers together, is a source of happiness and increases their aql, increases their power of rational thinking, and that means by which they are approaching Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he says that even if it's for a short time, it can be something which is very useful for them. The point is that the meeting together, it's more than just um, hearing what we have to say. And for example, listening to the lecture. Even the process of our hearts coming together, being in the same place, that can create happiness, it can create tangible, spiritual benefit. You know how we read in Hadith Al-Kisa, um, at the end of Hadith Al-Kisa, which we often read when we come together, you know, we say that, that this gathering of, of Shias, um, who are these lovers of the Ahlul Bayt, السلام, that the angels will be with them and be praying for them until they disperse. This has to do, um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a more general concept as well too, that when believers come together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they're accompanied by the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you cannot replace that physical meeting that we have together. Please say salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Now, the emphasis is on meeting together with people who can bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who share the same um, idea of what is the purpose of life, who accept the Ahlul Bayt as, as their guides. The flip side of that is that one of the instructions that we have um, in, when it comes to our social responsibilities is that we should decrease or stop our interaction at a social level with those who will take us away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is an important teaching that we have from the Ahlul Bayt. It's re reflected in a lot of their teachings, a lot of their um, the seerah and the life pattern that they had. This is something that we have to take seriously because we're here in a society where most of the people um, do not uphold the same belief system or the same practices. Let me quote you some ahadith in this regard, then we'll, we'll go into it a little bit further. Um, for example, the Imam salam says that somebody who spends time in the company of those who do evil, then that will be a cause of that person developing a negative opinion of those people who do good. Just being in their company. This person's a good person, but he goes and spends time in the company of bad people, it will cause him to form negative thoughts about those people who are good. This is something that, as, a, as, as someone who has traveled um, in, re in recent years, and, I, and I've had the opportunity to like, visit a community and then go away and then come back again. So I get snapshots um, of the state of a community. It's something some, sometimes I can see this happening, where somebody is you know, of a certain nature and you know, certain characteristics one year. And then one year later, the person's in the same family, the same community, but completely the way that they act and the way that they talk has changed. And it's clear that the variable that's changed over this year has been the company that that person is keeping. And it's illustrated in even the way that um, they gaze at somebody who is talking about these sorts of things. It's a gaze of, of uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it has a bit of arrogance in it, has a bit of defiance in it. And it's clear that it's because of the company that the person's keeping. And even we're told, um, you know the story of Nabi Nuh and his son. Nabi Nuh um, had a son who 
refused to join him on the boat, uh, on the ark, and gain salvation. He said that I'm going to go to the top of the highest mountain and I'll be saved that way. And so what happens is that the floods, the rain starts to fall, the flood uh, begins and the, the water level rises and finally gets to the point where um, even his son is drowned as well too. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Nabi Nuh that in, in, in reality this is not your son, innahu amalun ghayru salih, he's, he's just a compilation, a, a collection of deeds which are evil. So the question comes up, what happened to him? He, after all, wasn't he the son of a prophet of God? How could the son of a prophet of God possibly stand in defiance at the command of his father? So one of the, the, the scholars of Islam um, and in the form of poetry has given the reason for this, perhaps basing it on traditions that we have. He says that the reason for the son of Nabi Nuh alayhi salam uh, failing at that moment was because of the bad company that he kept. Yes, he had that nurturing and that household of Tawheed that Nabi Nuh established. But at the same time, he was being pulled in the other direction by his friends. So one of the effects was that, that, we, that it forms bad opinions about believers and those who do good. Another hadith tells us that the effect of spending time with those who um, are, are evildoers. Uh, the Imam, Imam Muhammad uh, at taqi tells us that this is something that we should avoid. And he says that the effect of this is that um, the person will be corrupted from the inside. Meaning that from the outside they will still take on the guise of somebody who is a believer, but from the inside this poison will enter them and it will corrupt them. Now, somebody might ask the question, what's the big deal? I'm going to be going and spending time with my friends who, are, who help me and remind me of God. I'm going to be going to the center on a weekly basis. I'll be going to the classes that are being offered. I'll be going to Salat al Jum'ah. But I'm also going to spend time with these other people just as a way of passing time. I'm not going to do anything haram with them. I'll just be in their company. What's the big deal? I came across a very interesting tradition from the life of Imam al-Hadi where a similar situation occurs. What happens is that he has a companion by the name of Sulaiman ibn Ja'far. And one day Imam Hadi confronts his companion Sulaiman. He says that Sulaiman, I see that you've been spending time with that man named Abdul Rahman ibn Ya'qub. Why are you spending time with him? Um, why is it that you are friends with him? So Sulaiman tells him, well actually he's a relative of mine and I'm friends with him. So the Imam Ali Salam tells him, well fine, but he is a person who has beliefs which are corrupt and he believes um, that God, na'udhu billah, has a, a physical body. Okay, now this is important because this has to do with beliefs. It's not saying that he's a person who drinks alcohol, or is a person who you know, openly invites you to sin. No, it has to do with his beliefs. His beliefs are corrupt. Now I want to make a side point here. The Imam Islam isn't telling him to cut off relationships with his relative because there's another responsibility that we have that we have to maintain at least the minimum amount of, of connection with our relatives. That doesn't mean that we necessarily have to visit them all the time, but even just keeping aware of what's going on with their lives, being there, being there for them um, if they need us. That's a separate issue. What the Imam is talking about is being friends with this person named Abdul Rahman. His problem is that he has corrupt beliefs. So the companion is going to ask the same question that's running through our minds, which is what's the big deal? Suleiman asks that, um, why should I cut off my relationships with him? I'm just friends with him and um, I'm not believing the same thing that he does. So why should I have to cut off? What problem is there? The Imam al -Islam tells him, he gives him an ultimatum. He says, either go with him and be his friend, but then leave us alone. Or be with us and then cut off your friendship with him. Very clear, very firm. And he says, because it is possible that you who want to be friends with him, that you could be friends with him. And then when the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala descends, you will be afflicted by the same punishment. 
Now, this is talking about something which perhaps we cannot see when you look at it with our limited perspective of what's going on on the outside. After all, he's not sitting in front of him. Maybe he's respecting his beliefs, whatever it may be. But this is something that the Imams, with their connection to the ghayb, knowledge of the ghayb, they're telling us that this is a reality. And then we find the ulama telling us the same thing based on the traditions. There's a, something reported from uh, Ayatollah Bahjad, rahmatullahi He says that if somebody is, spends time in the company of those who are heedless of God, this will cause their good deeds to turn into evil deeds. Their good deeds will turn into evil deeds. So this is an instruction that we have. We know whom we should spend time with and we know whom we should not spend time with. But practically speaking, how do we put that into practice? Because after all, we're in a society where we're living with non-Muslims. In fact, we have a responsibility. We were talking last night about the responsibility we have of conveying the truth, of spreading goodness, of, of forbidding, forbidding evil. So how can we do that by cutting off relationships? Well, the answer is that we have to take this into account and understand that this, is, this has to do with our friendship, those people that we rely upon, those people that we consider as those who will come to our rescue in the time of need, those whom we confide in, confide in those whom we, um, we turn to as a first line of support, etc. But when it comes to other perspectives, like our relationship at work, our relationship at school, our business-like dealings, of course, we're going to be dealing with people of all different walks of life. When it comes to somebody who has the ability to guide others, then of course he's going to be dealing with people who are at a lesser level of faith, those who, um, who do not remind him of God. But that's okay because he's doing his responsibility, his or her responsibility by conveying the message to them. But if it's the case, for example, that I myself am still weak, I don't have the capability of guiding others because I'm still in the process of exploration, then I don't have any responsibility to try to guide others. And so there's no need for me to put myself in that type of situation. And then there's one uh, practical technique that has been taught to us by our scholars, which I'd like to pass along to you. What they tell us is that there's sometimes when we are in a gathering of people who um, have a different perspective on things, their faith is less than our faith. And everything that they're doing is sort of opposed to us. We're not comfortable, but we have to be there for whatever reason. Maybe it's the case that it's a family affair, and for the sake of preserving those family ties, I have to be there. Now what do I do if I'm forced to be in that situation? They're talking about things that don't have any connection with me. Their, 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 their um, habits are contrary to the habits that I have. What they tell us is that if you cannot leave that gathering physically, what you can do is at the level of the heart, don't be present with them. On the outwards, make a show, make a show of being there with them, but on, in your heart, be in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And by that way, um, you will not be afflicted with those negative consequences that can be gotten just by being in the gathering of those people who would otherwise take you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are said salawat. Another principle, brothers and sisters, that we have, we talked about um, the principle of meeting with those who remind us of Allah, meeting with the Shia, uh, reviving the affair of the Ahlul Bayt, not in, intermingling with those who are harmful. So another point that we have is that if we want to call people to goodness, one of the principles that the Ahlul Bayt have taught us is to do so through our actions call to people through our actions. Now this is something that applies at all spheres of guidance. Even when it comes to our family, if we want to guide our children, we as parents have a responsibility to guide our children to the truth. The primary means of doing so is not by telling them and nagging them, but rather by showing them through our own actions. And that is the natural, powerful way of guiding other people to the truth. Many traditions tell us this, very beautiful traditions. Imam Sadiq says that may Allah have mercy on those people who are a lantern and a, and a guidepost for others. Now, how are they a lantern and a guidepost for others? It's through their actions that they call other people to us. And by them putting forth their best effort. Other traditions tell us that 
somebody who um, guides to the, and calls to the Ahlul Bayt by staying away from the prohibitions of Allah and staying away from disobeying Him and following what He's pleased with, those people um, will be a cause for others to come rushing towards us. If we want to be people who invite to the Ahlul Bayt, we can do so through our actions. Now when we read these type of traditions, sometimes we can understand them in the wrong way. One might say that, okay, this is telling us that we should make sure to act in a way that other people see us, do acts that you know, sort of call to the Ahlul Bayt in, in public, and that's the way that we call, to, call others to the Ahlul Bayt. But what, that, that's, a, that's a, not interpreting these traditions correctly. Actually what they are saying is that what we need to do is our responsibility as Shias in all respects. If we put our responsibility into practice and we do so without hiding, because after all, we're supposed to be um, not fear when it comes to practicing our faith, that itself will be a cause for others to come rushing to the faith. For example, the Imam Islam tells us that Kunu du'atan lil nasi bi ghayri al sinatikum. Be people who invite to us without using your tongues, such that they see from you these characteristics, they see from you um, piety, they see from you ijtihad, meaning um, somebody who's trying hard and striving. They see from you the salat, the prayer, and they see goodness from you. All of these will be forms of inviting others to us and to the truth. So what that's saying is that we need to be people who comprehensively put our faith into practice and that itself will be a way of inviting others to us. Let me give an example of this that I found inspiring. Imam Khomeini rahmatullahi when he had been exiled to France for a short amount of time because no other country would take him, none of the Muslim countries would even accept him. He had to go to, to Paris. So this is his first time in a non-Muslim country. And it's very interesting for us to read the history of how he acted there because this is a mujtahid going to a non-Muslim country. So it's interesting, you know, he, he, he settled down in a certain neighborhood there. Um, that neighborhood, obviously, the people who were living there were disrupted because this was something which was, you know, the, a worldwide affair. We had reporters coming in from the entire world, all four corners of the earth, to report on every single thing that was going on, who was coming in, who was going out, every statement they would, he would issue, what the response was to what was going on in Iran and what the Shah was doing there. So here, Imam Khomeini is there. Obviously, this, these neighbors, their lives would have been disrupted by all these um, ongoings. So what happens is, uh, he's there during the winter time. Christmas comes along. Imam Khomeini orders his, his people. He says that, I want you to go and buy a Christmas gift for all the neighbors and gift it to them. So they go and they, they buy a gift and they bring it to Imam Khomeini. They say, is this, is, is this good? Imam Khomeini says, no, in addition to what you buy, buy a flower as well too. So they go out again, they buy flowers, and they say, is it good? He says, yes. His son goes and hand delivers this gift on Christmas Eve to all of the neighbors. The next day, they come to Imam Khomeini's home to thank him, and the, um, the Christian leader of that community writes him a personal letter thanking him for what he did. And all these reporters who are there reporting on everything that's going on, they're excited. They said, you know, this is something for us to you know, ask about. So they come and rushing and they ask Imam Khomeini the reason for why he did this. And then he tells them that you know, this was the reason why you know, the, you know, it's Christmas. And they were, they were very interested because they said that you are, as a Muslim, you don't believe in the same things that the Christians do. Why is it that you're giving them a gift? I think this is a good example of the pattern that we need to set if we want to invite other people through our actions. Because in Islam we have so much um, recommendation about being respectful to neighbors, about giving gifts to each, each other, about showing love, about not disrespecting the symbols of other people's faiths. And after all, we accept Nabi Isa alayhi salam. It's interesting, on, in Iranian television, every Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, they, they send a message of Congratulations to the Christians who are living in Iran. Not that they are accepting, na'udhu billah, that Nabi Isa was born the way that they say. 
Not that they're even accepting that this was the date on which he's born, because there's debate about that, that whether it was actually the 25th of December or the 24th, whatever it may be. But just as a way of saying that in this point we have something in common. I don't want us to say from this that, okay, that means that we need to now, Brother Salim said that we can go and celebrate Christmas. Now, please. Okay, there's some places where unfortunately they've started having Christmas trees at home and giving gifts on Christmas. Now, this is taking it too far. But when it comes to a way of inviting to people on the basis of the teachings of the Bayt and Islam, I thought this was an excellent example. Please recite Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, we cannot underestimate the reward and the spiritual benefit that we can derive by inviting other people to the Ahlul Bayt in the way that the Ahlul Bayt told us to. We're talking about what is our responsibility, what is it that Allah wants from us. Ma arad mink from that hadith. This is one of the things that Allah wants of us, that we perfect ourselves, we work on ourselves so that we can be guideposts for the others. Because after all, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so keen on people turning to Him. Like there's a hadith of Qudsi which says that if a servant knew about the shawq and the passion I have for him to turn to me, then he would die out of shawq for me. Meaning that if he knew how much I longed for him to turn to me, he would develop a longing within his heart that he would die because of the, the extent of that longing. And we have examples of Urafa in history who, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removes that, that veil and that curtain from them and they are able to behold Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with their hearts, they die. They cannot, they cannot bear it. This is the, 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 how much Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants people to turn to Him. The same way that He wants that, the same way that we should want others to come to the teachings of the Ahlul Bayt and accept them. It's a responsibility. And we're told in a hadith that this is something which the Ahlul Bayt prized. There's somebody who goes to <coughs> the Imam alayhi salam <coughs> and he says to him, please recite salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. <coughs> He goes to the sixth Imam السلام, and he says that I'm somebody who goes into those lands of shirk. You know, maybe he visited, I don't know, China and um, some other countries where Islam had not yet reached there and had become prevalent. So he says that there's some of us, some of my friends who tell me that if you were to die in those places while you're on these journeys, then you would be resurrected with them on the Day of Judgment. So he goes to the Imam and he says, is this true? Is it the case that I'm, just by being in that land, that's it, there's no hope for me? The Imam alayhi salam tells him, Ya Hamad, he says that if you are somebody who tells people about our affair when you go there, and you invite people to our affair, then um, it's the case that you, when, if you were to die in, in that land, it would be as if when you're resurrected, you are as resurrected not as one person, but as a nation of people. This will be your reward. That your efforts will be the efforts of an entire nation. If you are able to do that, and, and the way to do that, again, is not just through words, but by putting these practices into action, by ourselves showing on a practical basis what it means to be a follower of the Ahlul Bayt these majalis, brothers and sisters, aren't just about reminders of what we're not doing. That's part of it. But it's also encouragement of what we are doing. It's not an option for many people who are present here to just go back home. There's no back home which provides an environment better than what we have here. So given that Allah placed us here, look at what the challenge is. The Imams knew that there were people, people like us who are in lands like these and they lay out our responsibility very clearly for us. The last point I want to make when it comes to principles that we need to keep in mind when being involved with Islam at a social level is a very important point. And it has to do with the vision that we have for our communities. Alhamdulillah, we as Shias in North America have done, 
put, a, put in a lot of effort, a lot of effort over the years in establishing what we have right now. And for the sake of all those who have spent you know, countless hours doing their utmost best to establish centers like this one and to maintain them and maintain the programming, I'd like us to all please recite a salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Not to in any way put down the efforts that have been put forth by all these pioneers, but talking about the vision that we need to establish for our young ones as we are trying to follow the Ahlul Bayt's advice when paving a future for them. What we need to understand is that build, establishing centers is not equivalent to establishing buildings. A center is not a building, maybe it's known as a building. But developing a center, developing a community is something other than just building a building and having programs. Establishing a community means that we need to establish a vision. We need to be calling people to something. And the only way that that can happen is by having proper and qualified leadership in these communities who themselves are models and are calling people to the truth with their actions. What this means is as we look forward to our future generations, our children, that we need to make sure that we are putting in those necessary means by which we can be having a generation of properly qualified ulama, we can come back and guide the people. And this is a vision that I'd like to propose that all of us accept and see what we can do in order to put it into practice. You see, my brothers and sisters, we need to understand that when it comes to establishing a true community, it's not just about having programs and just practicing what we have, um, the, the ritual acts of worship. No, there's a lot of things that we need to do. And there are a lot of decisions that need to be made. They cannot be made by those who do not have the knowledge to do so. It's a very simple thing. When it comes to making decisions, they need to be made, made on the basis of Islam. And what that means is that either we need to do ijtihad, or we need to do taqlid, or we need to do ihtiyat, or we need to apply the principles of the aql. And all of these are principles which are not an easy task for just anybody to do. Let me give you an example. We as a community would like to guide, it's a simple example, but you can take it and there's many, many other examples. We'd like to guide our community members on whether or not we should practice Halloween rituals. Is it a good idea for us to go out there, dress up, um, and get candy from people? Now this is something that people could express their opinion on, no problem. Yeah, I feel like it, you know, it's a good thing. Yeah, I feel like it's not a good thing because you know, it's a... Uh, paganistic practice, that sort of thing. But is it about expressing opinion or is it about making a decision based on Quran, Hadith, and Aqal? Right? You might say that this is a small matter, but is it a small matter? Right? Is it okay for us to do this? Maybe it's the case that this is, you know, if we take a stance on this, and this could you know, actually be something very powerful and lead to something else. We as a community would like to set up an event by which those who are young and at the age where they are ready to get married, there, there will be some way of those who, are, um, those who are compatible with others for them to meet in a halal sort of way, in a single event. Okay, now this has been tried in many places around the country, but have they done it on the basis of ijtihad, taqlid, etc.? Or has it been on, based on the basis of like, yeah, I think that it should be okay for us to just have an event and let people just kind of see each other, scope each other out, and then we'll let them meet. What's the big deal, brother? Just, you know, let's have, a, let's have an event. These are very serious decisions that need to be made and they must be made on the basis of if you want to see progress, if you want to build those communities that call to the truth and are going to be the way, the, the means by which Imam Zaman Islam is going to do his Zuhur, they have to be done on the basis that he wants us to establish them. Peace be salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. It does not mean, my brothers and sisters, that we are looking to establish for our children in the future, communities which are based on dictators. You know, dictator ulama who say that you must do this or you must not do this. No. It's just saying that when it comes to making decisions, it has to be done on the proper basis. One of the things which is haram, is mentioned in the books of fiqh, ahkam, that there are certain things which are haram, like doing ghibah of a, of a mu'min. For example, saying, um, uh, saying lies. For example, swearing. 
These are all things which are sins. One of the things which is a sin is al-qawlu bi ghayri ilmin aw hujjatin. Meaning to make an opinion on something, to make an opinion on something without having a knowledge, um, a basis of knowledge and certainty about that thing that you're making an opinion on. Now if somebody is in the position of leading a community and they do not have this resource, then how are they going to make those decisions? Does that mean that we, we should ab abandon our communities? No, it just means that when it comes to, if we want to take things further, the next level, right, and, and really go beyond, then we need to make sure we do things um, in a way that we'll be able to make those decisions on the right basis. And inshallah, this means that, you know, obviously, that we are going to have not just, you know, those, those future ulama from our children who are going to be doing that, but they will have a team of people who are working with them, who are trained, and there will be teamwork involved, but the decisions will just be made on the basis of an Islamic basis. Now, brothers and sisters, um, inshallah tomorrow we're going to be moving on, if Allah gives us a tawfiq, to the last part of the hadith, which is a very important part, which is understanding what it is that's going to take us away from our religion. Um, but tonight, for the remainder um, of, of the speech, I'd like to focus on um, that one individual who is in our hearts and our minds on this night. It's the eighth night of the month of Muharram. And as you know, throughout various communities, this is a night in which um, qamar e bani Hashim, Abu al-Fawd al-Abbas is commemorated. So we'd like to spend some moments um, recounting uh, what happened to him. But before doing so, we need to understand something about him. Because by understanding him, that will appreciate, help us appreciate him so that we can mourn him. When we look back in history, we can see that Abbas Islam turning out the way he was, this warrior, this champion, this loyal right hand of the Imam Islam, this was not something that was random. This was something that was planned. And Imam Islam knew that Imam Hussein would need a very strong right hand in Karbala. Somebody who would be his backbone, somebody who would be his support when facing all these difficulties and these challenges. And so what happened is after the death of Imam Ali Islam's wife, the mother of Imam Hussein, Sayyidah Fatima Sallallahu Alaihi Alaiha, he approaches his brother, Aqil. And he says, Aqil, I want you to find me a woman who is the most excellent and perfect woman among the Arabs so that I may marry her and she may bear a princely warrior for me. Aqil recommends a lady named Fatima. And he says that her household is no, there's no braver household than hers. From this Fatima, we find that Imam Ali Salam has four sons. And all four sons become sacrificed for the sake of Imam Hussein in Karbala. Because of her having four sons, she becomes known as Umm al Bani, the mother of the sons. The question comes up, brothers and sisters, what is it that's so special about Abbas Islam? Let's ask ourselves that. What is it, why is it that Abbas has such a special uh, place in our hearts? Is it the case that, that, is it just because Abbas was known to be a beautiful person? He was called Qamar Bani Hashim, the moon of Bani Hashim, because he was so radiant and beautiful that it was if, as, it was, as if he was the moon in the dark night. Was it because of his tall stature they say that when he would sit on the horse, he was so tall that his legs would reach the ground. Is it because Imam Hussein chose him as a standard bearer? The one who would carry the flag in the battle? Because after all, the standard bearers used to be very important um, in the battles, almost as important as the commander-in-chief himself. I think if we want to understand why it is that Hazrat Abbas's story really has such a place in our hearts, we have to go to a hadith um, that we have from Imam Sajjad al-Islam who tells us in praise of his uncle Abbas, he says, Rahimallahu al-Abbas, may Allah have mercy on Abbas, he is somebody who sacrificed and he was tested and he sacrificed for the sake of his brother, his own self, until his hands were cut off and Allah replaced these hands with wings in paradise by which he flies with the angels in the paradise. And then he says that inna lil Abbasi Indallahi Tabaraka wa ta'ala manzilatun yaghbituhu biha jamia shuhada yomal qiyama. 
that for Abbas is a station which is so elevated that all of the other martyrs put together will be envious of the station of Abbas السلام, on the Day of Judgment. And then we're told in a ziyarat that the most outstanding characteristic of Abbas السلام, is that he was somebody, we say, Assalamu alayka, ayyuhal abdus salih, al muti'u lillahi wa li rasulihi wa li amir al mu'minina wal hasani wal hussein. Peace be upon you, that righteous servant who was obedient to Allah, his messenger, and to Amir al Mu'minin, and to Hassan, and to Hussein. We see here that his most outstanding characteristics is his obedience. Hazrat Abbas had utter obedience to Imam Hussain. He would not go anywhere without Imam Hussein giving him permission. On the night of Ashura, there is a call that is a cry is made into the tent of Imam Hussein, calling for Abbas and his brothers to come out. Abbas is sitting with Imam Hussain. He doesn't even budge when this cry is made until Imam Hussain tells him that, okay, Abbas, you can go, respond, and see what they have to say. Only when his brother gives him permission does he leave the tent and he goes and sees that Shimmer, who has some family ties with him through his mother's side, is offering him amnesty along with his brothers. When Shimmer offers him this, he tells him that, make Allah curse you. Do you think I can accept you and leave aside Hussein, this offer from you, and leave aside Hussein alayhi salam? He goes away from Shimmer and comes back to Imam Hussein alayhi salam and joins him. This incident shows us that he is somebody who doesn't even budge without Imam Hussein alayhi salam giving him permission to do so. I ask forgiveness from the Imam of our time alayhi salam for the inability to properly capture the story of Abbas alayhi salam, but I will try my best to just recount to you what the historians have said about this incredible supreme sacrifice that he performed on the day of Ashura. As-salamu alayka ya Aba Abdullah al-Hussain As-salamu alayka wa ala akhika Abi al-Fadl al-Abbas ibn Amir al-Mu'min It is the day of Ashura. All the family and the companions, one after one, give their lives for Imam Hussein. Abbas alayhi salam sees that now he is, a, he is the last standing companion. This flag that he has been carrying all this time, he now wants to sacrifice himself and put it down. He seeks permission to go into battle and he asks his brother, Ya Akhi, Hal min Rukhsa? Oh my brother, is there any possibility? Can you give me permission to go into battle? Imam Hussain alayhi salam weeps very severely. He is very sad. Maybe he knows that this is the moment that he was anticipating was going to come. Imam Hussain alayhi salam tells him, Ya akhi anta sahibu liwa'i wa idha madayta tafarraqa askari Oh my brother, you are the flag bearer of my army. If you were to go away, my army will be dissipated. As Abbas alayhi salam responds to me, he says, قَدْ ضَعْقَ صَدْرِي وَسَئِمْتُ مِنَ الْحَيَاتِ وَأُرِيدُ أَنْ أَطْلُبَ ثَارِي مِنْ هَؤُلَاءِ الْمُنَافِقِينَ He says, Oh my brother, my chest is constricted. I am tired of living. I wish to seek revenge from these munafiqeen. Imam Hussain salam says, if this is the case, then first go and get some water for these children. Abbas salam approaches the enemy asking them for water, but they refuse to give it to him. At this point, Abbas salam wants to act upon the command of his brother. According to historical narrations, the children are dying of thirst, they are crying out, Al-Atash, Al-Atash. 
Perhaps Abbas salam, sees his niece by the name of Sukaina. Perhaps Sukaina is pleading to him, Oh my uncle, we are so thirsty, can you do something for us? Abbas salam, gathers his water skin and his sword and mounts his, so mounts his horse and goes towards the enemy army. According to historical reports, 4,000 men are guarding the banks of the Euphrates River. How can it be possible for one man to make it to the river? But we should not forget this is the son of Ali alayhi salam. He goes towards the water with his horse. The enemy mounts six attacks against Abbas to prevent him from reaching the water. But how can they possibly stop the son of Imam Ali alayhi salam? He goes to the river, he dismounts from his horse, he takes some water into his hand. It is halal for him to drink this water right now. Perhaps, why Abbas are you not drinking this water? It will give you some energy so you can go back and return. To <laughs> so you can return back to the children with the water. But we see that Abbas salam, flings the water back into the river and he cries out, Ya nafsu min ba'd al-Husayni huni wa ba'dahu la kunta an takuni hadha al-Husayn warid al-mununi wa tashrabina barid al-ma'ini O my soul, you are of little worth after Hussein. It is not befit, befit you to live after him. This is Hussein, and he is surrounded by death while you wish to partake from the cold sweet water. By Allah, this is not the deed of my religion. He flings the water back into the river, fills his water skin, mounts his horse. O oh Abbas, come back to the camp. The enemy realizes there is no way they can defend against Abbas to normal means. One of them hides behind a tree and he blindsides Hazrat Abbas salam, striking at him. We see that a cry comes from Hazrat Abbas salam. He cries out, Wallahi! Wallahi, in qata'atum yameeni, inni uhami abadan an deeni wa an imam in sadiq al yaqeeni. Najlin nabi al tahir al ameeni. What has happened to you, O oh Abbas? He says, By Allah, even if you cut off my right arm, they have cut off the right arm of Abbas. If you cut off my right arm, I will forever defend my religion and the Imam that is truly from the lineage of the Messenger, the pure, the trustworthy. Asad Abbas does not give up at this point. His sword goes into his left hand. The water skin is hanging from his chest. He mounts his horse. He goes forward. But once again, the enemy blindsides him. At this point, what cry does he make? He cries out saying, Ya Nafsi. Ya nafsu la takhsha min al-kuffari wa abshiri wa abshiri bi rahmat al-jabbari ma'a nabiyy al-sayyid al-mukhtari qad qata'u qad qata'u bi baghihim yasari fa aslihim ya rabbi harra al-nari O oh soul, do not fear the disbelievers. Rejoice in the mercy of the Almighty, along with the Messenger, the Chosen Master. Through their transgression, they have cut off my left hand. O oh Lord, drive them into the heat of the fire. I do not know how Hazrat Abbas salam, stays on the horse at this point, but somehow he does so. He grabs the water skin with his teeth and he goes forward until an arrow comes and bursts the water skin. Another arrow comes and is blessed on his blessed chest. Somebody takes a lance and strikes him. At this point, we are told that he cries out, O oh my brother, O oh Hussein, alayka minna salam, Abba Abdullah. According to one report, he now cries out, he says, Adrikni, come to me, O oh Hussein. When Imam Hussein Islam hears the cry of his brother, he comes rushing to him. He sees the situation. What he must have he seen at that point? Where is the right arm, O oh Abbas? What happened to you? Where is your left arm, O oh my brother? 
after Abbas alayhi salam breathes his last, Hussein alayhi salam cries out, Al-ana in kasara zahri wa qallat hilati. Now indeed my backbone is broken and I have no patience to continue on anymore. Let us go to Medina where the mother of Abbas alayhi salam then receives the news after some days of what has happened. Umm al is now once was known as the mother of four sons. What has now happened to them? According to some reports, she goes to Jannatul Baqi and all the people gather around with her to mourn with her and she cries out no longer should you call me Ummul Banin lest I be reminded of my sons I used to have four sons and at that time I was Ummul Banin but now I have no sons these were four were radiant ones like stars and now all of them have met with their death but then after mourning the other three, Umm al now has one thing in particular to ask. She has one question which is in her mind about these reports that she has heard. She cries out, Ya Layta Shari, Ya Layta Shari, Akuma Akhbaru. Oh, if only I knew. Is it the case that it is true what you have said? Bi anna Abbasan. Is it the case that they really cut off his right hand?